there are papers. All right, I've got a recording. It's talk show, so nobody's here. I know it. It's been, it's been rough. It's like I was having a bit of a brain burp. I couldn't find my share button. There it is. All right. So Gary, do you want to you want to join us up here? All right. Here we got some more. All right. No, got some more coming. <laughs> got some more coming. <laughs> well, top of the morning to you. She's the last. I I be a laddie. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad y'all are here this morning. We're a, a little shy in population, but I don't know. I don't know if it's stock show, spring break, all of the above. Nursery. Yeah, nursery duty. So, um, Jenny, last week's paper is right behind you in the corner, so you can grab that one and get the the first of the apostles that we talked about. The tenth. The tenth. Good morning, Jimmy. Good morning. So uh, I don't know. I've got a couple of extra prepared for today, depending on time, but that doesn't mean we have to go through them today. So don't worry about me cramming a whole bunch of stuff at you at exactly at 10 o'clock. So I have done that just to get done, but we're, we're not close to being done. So there's no reason to do that this time. All right, so uh, we'll add Paul at the very, very end because he's considered an anachronistic apostle, an apostle out of time. So we'll save him for the end. But we're going to pick up this week with the apostle named Bartholomew. And sometimes his name's called Nathaniel. So again, like last week, it's one of those situations where sometimes they're called by their Hebrew name. Sometimes they're called by their Greek name, okay? And so we see that quite a bit. Sure. So he's from Cana. Now, if you remember last week, we were talking about that little body of water at the top of the map there. That's the Sea of Galilee. So when you see Jesus teaching and he's at the Sea of Galilee, walking on water, calming the storm, fishing, whatever it is, that's where he's at. Jerusalem's down here in the middle of the map. Okay, so just to give you an idea. It's actually a lake, and the Romans called it Lake Tiberius. So you might hear that name in the Bible too. So depending, you see, and that's what's really cool about the Bible, because there's so many different audiences that those letters were written to. Mm -hmm. Some of the audience were mostly Aramaic. Some of them were mostly Jewish. Some of them were mostly Roman. So depending on who the audience was, names change. Where and exactly, yeah, the perspective that they that they were presenting was different also. So that's what's so awesome is that the naysayers are saying, oh, there's conflict in the Bible. This book says he was in the Sea of Galilee. And this one says Lake Tiberias. Well, learn your history and your geography and you'll be fine. Exactly. Yeah, I forget about that. So. Uh, most of the guys we talked about last week were up on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Bethsaida. Okay, so this time we're over on the west side in a city called Cana. And where have y'all heard that before? And that's Canaan. That's different. This is the town of Cana. Jesus' first miracle. Wine. Where he turned water to wine, it was at a wedding in Cana. Okay, so that's where Jesus's first miracle was. So this is home base for him. This is his stomping grounds. So this would be the relationship between Gonzalez, Luling, Nixon, Smiley. Okay, that's the area of ground that we're talking about. Walking distance, but usually a day's walk to get from one of the places to the others. So a lot of the apostles, we don't know exactly when they were born, but we do know their relative age 
to Jesus. And so a lot of times I'll say zero to 15 AD or 10 to 25 AD is when they were born because they were like the next generation younger than Jesus. I was going to say, did he have kids that were older than him? Yes, he did. So the anytime you see the word bar in a name, what does that mean? Son of. Son of. Okay. So now we got bar Tholomew. And so his name means son of Talmel or Talmai. And Tal Talmai is an Aramaic word meaning the furrows. So most likely he was into farming. farming. Okay, because it would be those furrows that you make in order to plant. In Hebrew, his name is Nathaniel. And anytime you see the last two letters E-L, that means of God. Gabriel, Mishael, Michael, okay? And that's God-given. Aramaic name is listed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. John's got his Hebrew name, okay? He's called Nathaniel and John. And be just because of his name, we know of at least one relative because he was Bar Talmai. His father was Talmai. All right, so his calling in John 1, verses 45 and 46, it says, Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, we found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel, can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Yeah, and so that's, that's how he got called. So we really don't see much of an interaction at this point with Jesus saying, come follow me, okay? Which is what we see from so many of the others. So he's best known for that phrase, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Jesus said of Bartholomew, you are a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And he said that in John 1, 47. And he proclaimed Jesus as the son of God, the king of Israel. Okay, so that's a pretty good proclamation right there. Uh, we don't see any interaction during Jesus's ministry of things that Bartholomew did that was noteworthy. He was just like a good follower. He was always there, okay? After Jesus, he carried a translation of Matthew's gospel into Northern India. Along with Jude Thaddeus, talk about him next week, they brought Christianity to Armenia. And the country of Armenia is north of Iran and east of Turkey. So it's that area on the eastern border of Turkey, okay? Now, his death was between 69 and 71 AD after converting Polymius, the local king, to Christianity. His brother, Prince, Prince Astigiages, Astigiages, ordered the torture and execution of Bartholomew. There's three different accounts of how Bartholomew died. One, he was skinned alive by Armenian pagans. One, he was crucified and skinned by Armenian pagans. And a third, he was skinned and crucified and beheaded by Armenian pagans. Whichever one wins, I don't know, but he is skinned alive in all of these cases, which is why in most of the paintings, this is one by Rubens, in most of the paintings that's done, he's got at least some or all of his skin missing. And this one, you can see the skin from his left arm is being skillfully removed, okay? The art of flaying really was an art mm -hmm. that the torturers took great pride in. Uh, your goal was to be able to remove all the skin without the person dying. And they, they did raise that to an art form for torture. So regardless of which account is true, the common thread is that his skin was skillfully removed while he still lived. This is why many of his portraits include at least some missing skin and or a flaying knife. 
The grave site of Bartholomew is at the St. Bartholomew, uh, the, the uh, Cathedral of St. Bartholomew. It's northeast of the town, well, I can't spell, the town of Bascale in present-day Turkey, near the Iranian border. It was abandoned in 1915 during the Armenian genocide, and it was blown up by the Turkish military. Um, there was still enough of it that it was usable by locals. They were just like hiding in it, but the dome and everything was pretty much destroyed. Since 2014, uh, an, a Turkish uh, historical preservation group took it over and they have been scheduling to rebuild it to be a tourist site, but they got permission in 2014, but nothing's been done to rebuild it yet. Turkey is where all of this stuff happened and Satan has got it pretty much closed off yeah. to Christians. It's one of the most dangerous countries to visit for Christians. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 So clarify one thing for me real quick. Sure. Who steals the temple? Was it the Armenian? Yeah. Where he was. Yeah. yeah, he was. He most of these guys were martyred because they converted somebody to Christianity that was a high person. You know, somebody that was that was a, a relative of the king or something, and that's usually what got them in trouble. Okay. All right. So then we get to Thomas. Now, what what do you notice? Is, which Thomas is this? That's doubting Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. So his other name is Teoma, which is Aramaic. Judas Thomas in Hebrew. Didymus in Greek. And of course, we call him Doubting Thomas. So he got he got labeled with the last thing that we saw. So again, he was born a little bit earlier or a little bit younger than Jesus was. He was born in Galilee, possibly Cana in Judea. So I've got my arrow pointing there again, over there at Cana. He was a carpenter. So they probably knew each other. So they probably knew each other. His name meaning, so his Hebrew name was actually Judas. But because there were already two Judases in the 12, they called him by his nickname, Judas the twin, or just twin. Didymus in Greek, Teama in Aramaic, and Thomas in Hebrew means twin. So that's that's what they called him. They called him twin. Okay, two mas. Okay, so it means twin. And so his relative then would be the unnamed twin. Now, just to tell you again about the naysayers, um, those that were trying to discount Jesus actually resurrecting from the dead were claiming that they called Thomas twin because he was Jesus's twin brother. And when Jesus died, then it was Thomas impersonating Jesus to give the illusion of Jesus raising from the dead. But it wasn't, it wasn't Jesus's twin because Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And the Catholics still maintain that Mary is a virgin. So there could have been no other children. Okay, so this was not Jesus's twin. And if you come across, if you do any Bible studies, you may come across that idea, but that's a false heretical idea. But you know, since they possibly knew each other growing up, being in the same business, you can see why he would doubt me. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, no, we're just going now. Uh-uh, no, he can't do that. No. Could be. Could be. So his calling, we don't know. We don't know if Jesus went up to him and said, follow me. Okay, we don't see that. And his name only appears in scripture 11 times. And of those 11 times, he only says something four times that's recorded. So we don't see much from Thomas. But two of those stories are very important. They're what define him. Okay. So he's best known in John eleven six 6, when Lazarus has recently died, the apostles resisted the idea of going back to Judea. And Thomas says, well, let's go with Jesus so we can die too. Okay. 
And I'm not quite sure what to make of that. You know, it's like, well, fine. If you're going to go, we'll, we'll just go die with you. You know, I don't know how sarcastic it was when he said that. Uh, and then in John 14, 5, he says to Jesus, we, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. Because by this time, Jesus in his ministry was letting them know, I'm, I'm a short timer now. I'm going to be going away from you very soon. And where I go, you can't follow me. And then that's why Thomas says, well, we don't know where you're going and we don't know the way. And Jesus rolls his eyes. Don't you wish they would add that in the Bible? I want to know what, what he really meant, you know? <laughs> and, and the chosen, does it show that? Does Jesus roll his eyes a lot? Because sometimes it's like, God. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep, I just I just don't know. I don't know. All right. So in Acts, Jesus appears to the apostles in the upper room. It's actually the second time. The first time was at the end of John. Okay. So now we're in Acts. It's the second time Jesus comes back. The first time Thomas wasn't there. Thomas shows up and the rest of the apostles are like, you won't believe it. Jesus came and Thomas says, I won't believe it unless I can put my hands in the nail scars and in his side. Well, the second time Jesus shows up, Thomas is there and Jesus just shows up with his hands out and says, here. He knew exactly what Thomas needed to see. When Jesus appeared and showed him, he stated, my Lord and my God. He got it. Finally, he understood. Okay. So that's Thomas. Now, after Jesus, not much is known of all of his missionary journeys, but according to a writing called the Acts of Thomas, the apostles divided up the world for their missionary journeys and India fell to Thomas. He landed on the Kerala coast in 52 AD. He brought Christianity to seven Southwest Indian villages. If you look at the religious, uh, what do you call it? Dem dem demographics of India, you still see today on the West Coast, there's a lot of Christians because that's where Thomas went and did his work. It was said that he was imprisoned by King Gundafur because Thomas gave the money for materials intended for Thomas to build a palace for the king to the poor. The king comes and says, what's the progress on my palace? And Thomas tells him, it's a palace in heaven. It's not a palace here because he gave the money to the poor to build the kingdom of God. And the, the palace that he's building, King Gundapur, is a palace that would last forever. Well, he ordered his execution, but that night, and there's, there's a lot more to the story, but I had to squinch it down here. The king had a dream of Jesus and called for Thomas to tell him more about this Jesus. So after being freed, Thomas, with a new zeal for missions, because he was reluctant to even go to India, he made a comment of how is a Jew supposed to talk to Indians? He continued sharing the gospel until his death. Uh, there is some anecdotal evidence that he also visited China while he was in that part of the world, but I really couldn't find any corroborating stories about that. He was killed with a spear in Chennai, India, by the order of a regional king named Mizdai at an area now called St. Thomas's Mount on July 3rd of 72 AD. He was buried there but later some of his bones were exhumed and taken to the cathedral of St. Tommaso Apostolo in Ortona, Italy. The love moving bones of these apostles around, because remember the early Catholics believed that there was power in the bones or body parts of the apostles. So if you remember Constantine's mother, scoured the world for anything that was related to Jesus. And she brought back to Constantinople um, 
pieces of wood that she said was from the cross, spikes that were from the cross, the crown of thorns, uh, the shroud of Turin. All of that stuff were artifacts that were given to churches of power, basically churches that paid enough, in order to house that relic there. It was enshrined and people would come in and you know do like the Jews and kiss and touch it in order to, to bless it, get blessings and receive favorable, favors. yeah, favors from God, okay? Favorable favors. All right, so that's it for Thomas. Any questions about Thomas? We don't know much about him, except he ended up being a missionary to India. Yeah. Yep. For all the doubters. All right, Matthew. So in Matthew, Matthew is the Greek name, uh, Matatai, Matatias, and Levi is what you would hear. And Levi is his Hebrew name. Matthew in Greek, Levi in Hebrew. So he's from Capernaum. Capernaum's a big city. So he was a city boy. So Capernaum is further north from Cana and it is due west from Bethsaida. So again, he's a younger one born between zero and 15 AD and his name means gift of Yahweh. In Mark and Luke, he's called Levi the tax collector. And in Matthew and John, he's only called Matthew. And his father is Alphaeus, because later on he is called Levi Alphaeus, bar son of Alphaeus. So in Matthew 9, 9, it says, And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. That same account is given in Mark 2.14 and in Luke 5.27. So can somebody tell me how the tax collectors worked in this part of the world? They, took they were tax, definitely crooks. They took the tax that was supposed to be taken but didn't make money, they took more tax. For right. Themselves. So they basically bid to the Roman governor for the job of being a tax collector. Mm -hmm. The highest bidder then gets the job. That bid that he gave is the money that he has to extort from the people. And then he would have to give that amount of money to the governor. In order to make his living, he had to take more money than was actually needed, required by Rome. And then that's what he would live on. Then he also, in order to move up in the ranks, would try to uh, hire other tax collectors to form a conglomerate. And he would have to pay them, which means his taxes are now even higher that he's extorting from the people. So this was a racket. It was a whole racket. And they were already... No, the taxes we pay are nothing compared to the taxes that were pressed onto the Jews because they not only had their Roman tax, but they had the Israeli temple tax as well. And they had property tax and they had sales tax. So they were taxed between 35 and 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay, because everybody had to get their juice. So all of the taxes were inflated so that the tax collectors could get their money. Okay, so that's what was going on. So the mafia was born in what year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the second oldest profession. Yeah. So Matthew is best known for being a Jewish tax collector for Rome, but he left everything. He abandoned his post. He left the money on the table. So technically, that made him marked for death. He's now a criminal, okay, following Jesus. And he knew it. He left everything to follow Jesus, but not much else is recorded about him. But he did write the second of the four synoptic gospels, okay? 
So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew was actually the second one written. Mark was first. And the book of Matthew, or the book of Matthew was written for a Jewish audience, and it was called the most Jewish of the Gospels. If you read Mark, it reads more Greek. Matthew reads more Jewish, okay? Which is why when they give the lineage of Jesus, they give different lines of lineage. One comes through Matthew, or one comes through Joseph, and one goes through Mary. And it has to do with the audience. What will the audience respect more? Okay? And it was written about 15 years after Mark. The book was written about 85 AD. Okay, so he was... He was pretty old. He would be like 60 when he wrote it. And back in this day, you got to let me finish my thought. Back in this day, if you live past 40, you're an old dude. Okay. So that was pretty good to be living at 60 in those days. We're right behind you. Yeah. All right. So after Jesus, again, not much is known about Matthew. He preached throughout Judea before going to other countries. Ancient writers do not agree as to all of the countries he ministered to, but all agree that he ended up in Ethiopia. Okay, so his greatest ministry was in Ethiopia, Africa. Now, when, when you think of Ethiopia today, because all of y'all are of a certain age, when y'all think of Ethiopia today, what do you think of? Poverty, famine, the blackest of black people. They're so black, they're purple, right? That black. But in Matthew's day, Ethiopia was a Roman outpost. Okay, so it was more European than it was Africa. Okay, think of... Uh, Mark Antony, Cleopatra. Cleopatra was a white girl, okay? She was not an African queen. She was white. So most of North Africa was olive skin. So they were closer to Italians than they were Africans because everywhere that you could get to in that day was via the Mediterranean. And so everybody from Greece and from Italy, and from France, and Germany, they all just went across the sea to get to the new lands. And so it was settled very white in Northern Africa. All right. So while preaching in Ethiopia, he converted Ephigenia, the virgin daughter of King, uh, King Egypus or Egypus. At her request, he consecrated her to church service, basically a nun before the Catholic church started, okay? But basically a nun. She was going to serve the church and only serve the church, basically marrying her to church work. Now, when King Aegyptus died and was succeeded by his brother, Herticus, can't you tell by the names? That's very, that's, that's very Roman, okay? Like, you know, Marcus Aurelius, all the us's that are in there, Spartacus, okay? So these are these are Roman kind of kings. So King Aegyptus was uh, succeeded by Herticus, and Herticus tried to get Matthew to persuade Ephigenia to marry him, his niece, okay? Now, Matthew invited Herticus to Sunday service. He was preaching. And during his sermon, he rebuked the king for lusting after his own niece. The outraged king ordered his death right there on the spot. Although the date is uncertain, it's thought to have happened around 90 AD. And his tomb is located in the crypt of Salermo Cathedral in southern Italy. Salerno. I can't see. A lot of them got moved. Yes. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Italy. Yes. When we when we went to Spain last year, 
we went to which saint? I don't know. I don't know. The, the, Domingo, the, the, Santo Domingo, Santo Domingo, but it was, it's one of the apostles. So it's the Spanish name for the apostle. Yeah. Um, he died in Jerusalem and basically was thrown off the mountain to the trash heap mm -hmm. and his followers took the body and took it to Spain because that's where he was a missionary. Yeah. So a lot of the moving was was either done at that time by his followers or it was done at a later time when Catholicism was really taking root and it was safer to do these things. And they still have their journey here every year. Yeah. yeah. All right. Then we got James the Less, James the Lesser, Little James. Yeah. Okay. So he had he had nicknames. Uh, the Greek word for little is mikros, so James mikros, where we get the word micro from, microscope. Okay, is he short? No. So they think that he was smaller and younger than the other James that they called James the Great. So it was not ever meant to be uh, a, a word that talked about how good or bad somebody was, better or worse somebody was. It had to do either if, of age, excuse me, of age or of size. Okay. So again, born in Galilee, so up in this area around the sea. He was born 10 to 20 AD. So it means he's even wow. younger than the rest of these guys. So he was a teenager when he was following Jesus. Uh, his name means follower. So if you haven't known anybody named James, means follower. His occupation is unknown. Uh, his father was Alphaeus, so that would make him a brother of Matthew, unless it's a different Alphaeus. But the idea is that that's the same, okay? Um, he's best known for possibly being the first to see the risen Lord, according to 1 Corinthians 15. So we don't know because um, one of the apostles last week also is credited for being the first. I think, it's the I think it was Peter. I thought it was, I thought it was the woman. First of the apostles. Oh, apostles. So, all right. So after Jesus, he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. He led an important meeting of the early church at the, the Council of Jerusalem in the year 50 A.D. At this meeting, St. Paul, St. Peter, and other church leaders discussed whether Gentiles or people who were not Jews, Jewish could become followers of Jesus. James listened carefully to the discussion, and he helped the group to decide that the church was open to all and that all people could be saved by living as followers of Jesus. This is recorded in the book of Acts. Okay, so you can read about all of that. It got very heated. The apostles were angry at each other, okay? They split because of this decision, where some of the apostles says, well, fine, you go talk to the heathens. We're going to go talk to the good folk, the Jews. And they split up over that. Do you remember when we were talking about uh, Paul, when we were talking about his missionary journeys, Paul was one that was trying to settle this idea between should we even talk to Gentiles or not? And uh, he was still convincing the Gentiles to send their money to the Jerusalem church. And that's the only thing that kept the Judaizers, the faction of the apostles that wanted everybody to be Jewish first, happy enough to allow him to continue his work. So there was a lot of backbiting and church splits and all of that stuff, even in the first century AD. So church fighting is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. All right. So his death, James was preaching near the Jewish temple there in Jerusalem when a group of enraged Pharisees demanded James and his followers to renounce Jesus. Of course, he wouldn't. He was arrested, 
and he was then executed under order of King Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa would be the grandson of King Herod that ordered all babies under the age of two to be executed when Jesus was born. And the son of the King Herod that was in charge when Jesus was ministering. So James died relatively young. Then. He died young. Yeah, he died young. So his pictures look like he's in his 30s. Mm -hmm. Paintings of him. So he died around 62 AD. They took him and they threw him down 100 feet from the Temple Mount by the scribes and the Pharisees. They picked him up and threw him down. Kneeling after the fall, his last words were, I beseech thee, Lord God our Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was then stoned and his brains were dashed out with a fuller's club, which is a special kind of staff that has a paddle on the end that they would stir laundry to dye it, okay? And so most of the statues of him, he is holding on to a staff, but instead of being a regular staff, it's got the paddle on the end to show how he died. So he was killed in Jerusalem, little James. Just because? Yep. Because he was teaching others to follow, okay? And again, that's pretty much how most of these guys died is because they were preaching the word because that's what was required of them, okay? I guess I finished way too early. That was, oh. That's Is it? Everybody? No. Oh. No, that's seven. Okay. That's seven of the 12. What's well, review? <laughs> okay, any questions? Um. <laughs> Now, again, a lot of this information comes from Fox's Book of Martyrs. So you can read that or the modern version of it called Jesus Freaks. And it gives you the story of how the apostles and other great names of Christianity met their demise. What I like is this doesn't only come from scripture. That history. It's, it's history. And so... Yeah. Okay. All right. No questions. I'll end the online audience. Bye, Dreadless. Bye, Dreadless. Thank <laughs> you.